let's talk about where the Fourier coefficients come from in a Fourier series. So let's consider a function that repeats with a period of 2 pi, and we know we can represent that by a Fourier series with a constant term, a sum of cosine terms, and a sum of sine terms in general. Now you may ask the question that everybody asks themselves at some point in their life, which is, where do Fourier coefficients come from? Um, and so we can either ask our parents, um, or we can try and derive it. And so in this video, we're going to try and derive it. Uh, and we're going to use some magic. And the magic is named various things. You could call it the Fourier trick, uh, or uh, oftentimes called orthogonality. Those are the tricks that we're going to use. OK, so let's start with a fun fact. Um, the integral from negative pi to pi of cosine of n times x dx, where n is some integer, what is that? Well, if you think about it, you're integrating cosine over a whole period, and so that turns out to be 0. A similar result holds for sine of nx. You integrate sine of nx over an entire period, you also get 0. OK, so let's use this now to find a 0, the constant part of the Fourier expansion. So let's rewrite the expression we had above. Now I'm going to leave some spaces here, conspicuously placed, because we're going to use those spaces. Uh, and so I have my cosine term and my sine term, b sub n sine of n x. OK, so now on both sides of this, let me integrate from negative pi to pi over the x direction, integrate dx. So integrate dx both sides, so every term on the right-hand side as well, dx. Now, there's some constants I can pull out. I can pull out a naught. If you think about it, you can pull out the sum of the a sub n's and the sum of b sub n's. And so let's rewrite what we have then on the right-hand side. We have a0, the integral of negative pi to pi of dx, the sum of, over the a sub n's, the integral from negative pi to pi of cosine of nx dx. Oh, wait, we can know that that's equal to 0 from our fun fact before. And then a sum over b sub n times the integral of sine of nx dx. Oh, we also know that that is 0. So the right-hand side simplifies considerably. We just have to do this integral, which gives us 2 pi. And so now we know that the integral of f of x dx is equal to 2 pi a naught, or flipping this around, we know that a naught is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from negative pi to pi, f of x dx. So if I give you an f of x, you can compute a naught now. One way to think of this is that a naught is the average value of f of x over an entire period. So let's look at how this might work with some examples. I'll quickly draw some examples here, three different ones. So one example is going to be a square wave that looks like this. Another one is going to be a linear term, a sawtooth. And then I also have a square wave maybe that looks like that. So in the first case, a naught is equal to 0. The average value is 0. And in the second case. And in the third case, if you compute a naught, you'll find that a naught is equal to 1 half. That's the average value of the function over one period. OK, so that's some intuition on what a naught is and how to compute it. But what about the a sub n and the b sub n? Well, we're just going to solve for the a sub n right now, but we need to use some conditions uh, about sines and cosines, um, namely their orthogonality. And so here are some more fun facts about cosines and sines. So let's integrate from negative pi to pi cosine of nx times cosine of mx dx. Uh, and let's specify that m and n are integers here. So if you do this integral, it turns out you will either get 0 if n is not equal to m, or you get pi if n is equal to m. So that's kind of nice. Uh, and we call this um, orthogonality. And so we end up saying that cosine nx, cosine mx are actually orthogonal to each other. Namely, if they're not the same, then uh, their integral is 0. There's a clear analogy we're making here to orthogonal vectors, where if you dot two orthogonal vectors, you get 0. And so the idea here is um, taking the integral of cosine uh, nx times cosine of mx is kind of like a dot product. So there's a useful notation that is sometimes used here. Uh, so let's rewrite this integral that we had above, cosine of nx, cosine of mx dx. Sometimes we write this as pi times delta mn, 
where this delta here is a Kronecker delta. Um, and what the Kronecker delta is, is it's a way of encoding this um, fact that it's 0 if m is not equal to n, and it's 1 if m is equal to n. Okay, so that's kind of a useful way of writing this. The signs are also orthogonal. And so if you multiply sine of nx and sine of mx, integrate from negative pi to pi, then you also get pi times delta m n. Interestingly enough, it's the same result as the cosines. Maybe that's not really surprising. Sines and cosines are really closely related to each other. Uh, what about if we mix the sines and the cosines? What does orthogonality tell us there? So let's integrate from negative pi to pi sine of nx cosine of mx dx. Well, it turns out you get 0, and you get 0 even if n and m are the same. So for any n and m, this, you always get 0, even if those happen to be the same. Okay, so there's three useful relations we call orthogonality of sines and cosines that we're going to use here in a little bit. So we're just going to box those, and then we're going to move on. Okay, so those are the facts that we're going to use. Now let's use these facts to find the a sub n Fourier coefficients. So let's again rewrite the expression we had for uh, our Fourier expansion. And again, we're going to leave lots of space here because we're going to be doing some things, adding some things onto this equation and integrating. So we have a0, the sum of the cosines, and the sum of the sines. OK, so now on both sides, I'm going to integrate again from negative pi to pi but I'm also going to multiply by cosine of mx dx. I'm going to do that everywhere on both sides. So on the constant term, on the cosine term, and on the sine term, cosine of mx dx. OK, again, I can pull out constants. I can pull out the sum of the constants here and there. And then let me simplify the right-hand side. So then I have a0, an integral from negative pi to pi, of cosine of mx dx. But I know that's 0. OK, so that's useful. Then I have a sum uh, of the a sub n's, integral negative pi to pi, cosine of nx, cosine of mx dx. We know what that is, but let's come back to it in a second. I have the sum of the b sub n's, integral from negative pi to pi, the sine of nx, cosine of mx dx. And we know that these mixed integrals also vanish. So we can throw that out. And the only term we get is the integral of the cosines. And so we know that that is, so let's carry the sum a sub n's. We know that the result of that is pi times delta m n. Because this integral here is pi times delta m n, the Kronecker delta. Now this Kronecker delta, delta m n, Again, is only non-zero when n is equal to m, whereas the sum runs over all possible n. So that's interesting. So in the sum, we have an infinite number of terms, but there's only one that's non-zero, which was when n happens to be equal to m. And so we get pi a sub m on the right-hand side, just that one term. Carrying down the left-hand side, it's this integral f of x cosine of mx dx. So now we have a way to compute the a sub m coefficients. It's 1 over pi, take the integral from negative pi to pi, of your function f of x cosine of mx dx. Um, it's common, in fact, to relabel the m to an n. It's just an index, so we can call it whatever we want. So let's just call it a sub n. Uh, and then we have the integral f of x cosine of nx dx. So this tells us what to do. If I give you a function f of x, you can compute the a sub n by computing this integral. There's a similar procedure uh, to get the b sub n's for the sine expansion, uh, and I'll let you work that out on your own.